Prior to the campaign against the Western powers, which we would have been glad to avoid, the experience of fighting in Poland was studied. This experience showed, and for me it was not unexpected, that light infantry divisions are incomplete formations. It was decided to reform them into tank divisions numbered six to nine. The motorised divisions proved to be too cumbersome in their composition, and one infantry regiment each was withdrawn from them. The rearmament of tank regiments with T, II and TIV type tanks, which was especially important and necessary, progressed extremely slowly because of the weak production capacity of industry and as a result of the canning of new types of tanks by the general command of the ground forces. Several armoured divisions and the Greater Germany Infantry Regiment were placed under my command for combat training. I was mainly occupied with thoughts about the plan and possible course of operations in the West. The general command of the land forces, pushed by Hitler, intended to use the old plan again, the so-called Schlieffen Plan of 1914. It was quicker and simpler, but contained nothing new. So very soon thought began to work in a different direction. One day in November 1939, Manstein asked me to come to see him. He gave me his views on an offensive by a large armoured force through Luxembourg and southern Belgium to the Maginot Line at Sedan, with the aim of breaking through this fortified section and then the entire French front. Manstein asked me to consider his proposal from the point of view of a specialist in armoured forces. After a detailed study of maps and on the basis of personal acquaintance with the conditions of the terrain during the First World War, I was able to assure Manstein that his planned operation is feasible. The only condition I could put was the use in this offensive of a sufficient number of tank and motorised divisions, and preferably all of them. After that, Manstein drafted a report note. Approved and signed by Colonel General von Rundstedt on December 4, 1939, the report note was sent to the General Command of Land Forces, but it was not approved there. The Army High Command initially wanted to use only one or two panzer divisions for the Arlon Offensive, an exchange of views on this issue began. I considered such forces too weak, and therefore the operation aimless. Fragmentation of the already weak armoured forces would be the biggest mistake that can be made at all. Facing the possibility of making such a mistake just stood the main command of ground forces. Manstein insistently sought his own, which brought on himself the disfavour of the general command of the land forces to such an extent that he was appointed commander of the army corps. He asked to give him at least a tank corps, but his request was not granted. So Manstein, our best operational mind, with a corps in the third echelon and participated in the campaign, the brilliant realisation of which was largely due to the initiative he showed. He was succeeded under Colonel General von Rundstedt by the Kalmer General von Zodenstern, Meanwhile, an incident that occurred in the Air Force forced the command to abandon the plan Schlieffen. Air Force liaison officer on the night of January 10th, 1940, with important documents, flew the plane across the Belgian border, which was forbidden. The airplane made an emergency landing on Belgian territory. According to the documents which were with the officer, it was possible to guess about the planned offensive according to the Schlieffen plan. Whether he managed to destroy the documents was unknown. In any case, it should be considered that the offensive may have become known to the Belgians and apparently also the French and British. In addition, Manstein, who appeared to Hitler in connection with the appointment to the post of corps commander, took the opportunity to give him his opinion on future operations. Thereafter, Manstein's operational plan became the subject of scrutiny. On February 7, 1940, during a staff war game in Koblenz, I got a clear picture of it. At this game, I proposed on the fifth day of the campaign to launch an offensive with large tank and motorised forces to break through the defences on the Maas River at Sedan and further develop the offensive in the direction of Amiens. Chief of the General Staff of the Land Forces Galda, who was present at the manoeuvres, called this proposal meaningless. It seemed to him that it is enough to reach the Mars armoured troops, to create on it pre-bridge fortifications, 
to wait for the approach of field armies and then launch a joint offensive, and not earlier than on the ninth or tenth day of the campaign. I fervently objected and emphasised that it is a question of concentrated and sudden use of all the striking power of the available in a limited number of tanks in one decisive area to expand the breakthrough and then, strengthening the strike group, to go to such a depth so as not to fear for the flanks and immediately exploit the possible success, regardless of the degree of advance of army corps. My opinion of the importance of the border fortifications was supported by Major von Stiota, the fortification specialist attached to the army group, who had carefully studied the matter. Mr. von Stiota based himself mainly on the available aerial photography material, and his arguments were therefore irrefutable. On February 14th, in Mayenne, at the headquarters of the 12th Army of Colonel General List for the second time in the presence of Halder, a war game was held, at which the battle for the crossing of the Meuse was played out. The main question put before me was whether the armoured divisions should independently force the river or wait for the approach of infantry, whether in the latter case they should take part in the offensive immediately after forcing the river, given the difficult terrain in the Ardennes, north of the Meuse. The exchange of views proceeded so discouragingly that General von Wietersheim, commander of the 14th Motorised Army Corps, which was to follow my corps, and I concluded by saying that under such conditions we could not believe in carrying out this operation. We stated that this use of tanks was wrong, and that if it were to be carried out as ordered, a crisis of confidence might result. The matter became even more complicated when it became clear that Colonel General von Rundstedt also does not have a clear idea of the combat capabilities of tanks and favoured a cautious solution to this issue. Now that's where Manstein was needed. Especially much had to break the head over the issues of leadership of a large number of armoured formations. Finally, after much debate settled on the candidacy of General von Kleist, who had not previously been a supporter of tank troops, after it became clear that my tank corps in any case will have to strike at the enemy through the Ardennes, I diligently engaged in combat training of generals and staff officers to fulfil the upcoming task. In my subordination went to the 1st, 2nd and 10th Panzer Divisions, Infantry Regiment Greater Germany. A number of corps units and units, among which was also one division of mortars. All the units, with the exception of the Great Germany Regiment, were familiar to me. Some I had dealt with before the war, others during the war years, so I certainly believed in their fighting ability. Now I had an opportunity to prepare these men for a heavy task, in the success of which no one actually believed, except Hitler, Manstein and me. The moral struggle for the realisation of this idea was very exhausting. Therefore I needed a little rest, which was granted to me in the second half of March. However, even before that, on March 15th in the Imperial Chancellery held a conversation between the commander of Army Group A with Hitler. The conversation was attended by General von Kleist and myself. Each of those present reported their thoughts on the method of accomplishing the task at hand. I was the last to report. My plan was as follows. On the day scheduled by the order to cross the Luxembourgian border and then move through southern Belgium to Sedan, to force the Maas River at Sedan, capturing on the left bank of the Prebridge fortification to ensure the crossing of the infantry corps following me. Briefly, I explained that my corps will advance through Luxembourg and southern Belgium in three columns, that I expect to reach the Belgian border positions on the first day and, if possible, to break through them, on the second day to continue the advance through Neuchâteau, on the third, to cross the Semois River at Bouillon, on the fourth, to reach the river. Mass on the fifth day, to force the river and by the evening of the same day, to capture the Prebridge fortification. Hitler asked, and what do you want to do next? He was the first to put this decisive question at all. I replied, if there is no order to suspend the advance, I will the next day to continue the offensive in a westerly direction. The high command must decide whether this blow should be directed at Amiens or Paris, the most effective, in my opinion, would be the direction through Amiens to the English Channel. Hitler nodded his head but said nothing. 
only General Bush, who commanded the 16th Army operating on my left, exclaimed, No, I do not believe that you will be able to force it. Hitler awaited my answer with obvious tension. My answer was, You do not need to do so. To this, Hitler also said nothing. Subsequently, I never received an order that provided for more than the creation of a pre-bridge fortification on the Mars River. I independently drafted all the decisions up to the approach to the Atlantic coast at Abbeville. The High Command had an inhibiting influence mainly on my operations. After a short vacation, I again began preparations for this major operation. The long winter was replaced by a mild, charming spring. Repeated drill alarms threatened to turn into combat alarms. Before describing the events, I think it would be appropriate to explain why I was so confidently preparing for the heavy offensive ahead. For this purpose, I shall have to go back a little. World War I, after a brief period of manoeuvring on the Western Front, froze in positional battles. No concentration of military means, which had reached enormous proportions, was able to move the fronts until, in November 1916, tanks appeared on the enemy's side and carried, thanks to their armour, tracks and armament, consisting of guns and machine guns, previously unprotected soldiers through barrage and wire fences, through ditches and craters alive and combat ready to the front of the German defences. The offensive was again restored to its rights. This phenomenon was peculiar and deserved serious attention. Unfortunately, the Germans underestimated tanks during that war. It no longer matters whether this is due to the lack of technical awareness of government officials or to the weakness of the German war industry. How great is the importance of tanks, showed the Treaty of Versailles, which prohibited Germany, under penalty of punishment, to have and produce armoured cars, tanks and other similar machines that could serve military purposes. Consequently, in our enemies the tank was considered a military weapon of such decisive importance that we were forbidden to have it. Hence, I concluded that it was necessary to scrutinise the history of this combat weapon of decisive importance and trace its further development. From the theoretical analysis made by a man unconstrained by any tradition, a conclusion was reached about the design and use of tanks and the organisation and use of armoured formations, a conclusion that went beyond the theories prevailing abroad. In persistent arguments lasting for years, I succeeded in putting my convictions into practice before other armies had approached similar problems. The advantage in projected organisation and in the combat use of tanks was the first factor on which my belief in success was based. Even in 1940, I was almost alone in the German army in believing this. A comprehensive study of the First World War allowed me to make an in-depth analysis of the psychology of the belligerents. I knew the German army well from my own observations. About the state of mind of our Western opponents, I had also created a certain opinion, which was confirmed in 1940. In military thought, in spite of the new weapon, tanks, to which the opponents should be mainly grateful for their victory in 1918, position warfare prevailed. France had the strongest land army and the largest armoured forces in Western Europe. Anglo-French armed forces in the West in May 1940 had at their disposal about 4,800 tanks. In the German armed forces on the list was listed as 2,800 tanks, including armoured cars and in fact by the beginning of the offensive they numbered about 2,200. Consequently, the enemy had a double superiority, which was reinforced by the fact that the French tanks surpassed the German armour protection and calibre of guns, however inferior to them in the perfection of control devices and speed. Despite the presence of this strongest mobile combat weapons, France created the Maginot Line, the strongest fortified frontier in the world, so why was the money invested in fortifications not used to modernise and strengthen the mobile assets? The efforts of de Gaulle and Daladier in this direction were ignored. Hence the conclusion that the high command of the French army did not recognise or did not want to recognise the importance of tanks in manoeuvre warfare. In any case, all known to me, manoeuvres and major military exercises testified to the intention of the French command 
to organize the management of its troops in such a way that reliably justified decisions fully ensure maneuvering and carrying out systematic offensive and defensive measures, strive to accurately determine the position and grouping of enemy forces before taking a decision, and when it was already taken, then acted in absolute compliance with it and acted, I would say, exactly in accordance with the scheme of the French army. This desire to act strictly according to the plan, leaving nothing to chance, also led to the inclusion of tanks in the land forces, in a form that would not violate the scheme, I, their distribution to infantry divisions, and only a small proportion of tanks were intended for operational use. The German command could safely assume that the defence of France, taking into account the use of fortifications planned cautiously and schematically on the doctrine based on the conclusions from the First World War, i.e. the experience of positional warfare, a high estimate of fire and underestimation of manoeuvre, the familiar principles of French strategy and tactics of 1940, the opposite of my method of fighting, were the second factor justifying my belief in victory. By the spring of 1940, the German side had a clear picture of the grouping of forces and fortifications of the enemy. We knew that on the Maginot line between Montmédy and Sedan, very strong fortifications alternate with weak ones. The fortifications running from Sedan to the Channel we called the continuation of the Maginot line. We also knew the location and in the main the strength of the Belgian and Dutch fortifications erected against Germany. The garrison of the Maginot Line was insignificant. The main forces of the French Land Army, including armoured divisions and the British Expeditionary Force, were concentrated in French Flanders between the Maas River and the English Channel, with a front to the northeast. In contrast, Belgian and Dutch troops were deployed to defend their countries against attack from the east. From this distribution of forces, it was possible to infer the enemy's calculation that the Germans would act a second time on the Schlieffen Plan of 1914. Therefore, the main forces of the Allied armies were apparently intended to be used against the encompassing manoeuvre of the Germans through Holland and Belgium. To ensure the advance of Allied troops in Belgium, the French did not have sufficient reserves in the area of Charleville or Verdun. It seemed that the French High Command considered it impossible to any other option for the offensive, except for the old plan Schlieffen. This known to us grouping of enemy forces and the possibility of predetermining his behaviour in the initial period of the offensive German troops were the third factor that determined my belief in victory. To this could still be added some, though less reliable, but worthy of mentioning considerations on the question of the general assessment of our opponents. We knew the French from the First World War and respected them as brave and steadfast soldiers who vigorously defended their country. We had no doubt that they had retained these qualities. As for the French High Command, we were surprised to see that they did not take advantage of the favourable occasion for an offensive in the fall of 1939, when the bulk of the German land forces, especially armoured forces, were tied up in Poland. The reasons for this restraint could not be determined at the time. One could only speculate. At any rate, the caution of the High Command was surprising and suggested that in the top they hoped to avoid a serious military campaign. The passive, to some extent, behaviour of the French during the winter of 1939-40 led to the conclusion that France had little desire to fight. From all this it followed that a purposeful sudden strike by large tank forces through Sedan to Amiens, with access to the Atlantic coast, will meet only a strongly stretched flank of the enemy in readiness to move into Belgium. To repel such a blow the enemy has little reserves. Such a blow promised great hopes of success, which if immediately used could lead to the encirclement of all the main forces of the enemy advancing into Belgium. It was now a question of convincing my superiors and, to the same extent, my subordinates of the correctness of my thoughts and thus of obtaining the freedom of action authorised from above and the correct understanding from below. If the resolution of the first question was very imperfect, the latter was much better. In the event of an offensive in force remained the order that the 19th Army Corps advancing through the northern part of Luxembourg and the southern part of Belgium, reaching the river Maas at Sedan, 
to form a pre-bridge fortification on it, which will enable the infantry divisions advancing behind it to force the river. In case of sudden success, no instructions were given. There were developed issues of interaction with aviation. I had to coordinate my actions with the short-range aviation connection of the extremely brave General von Stutterheim and with the aviation corps of General Lerzer. In order to organize effective interaction, I invited pilots to the exercises I organized and myself took part in the war games conducted by Lerzer. The subject of discussion at these war games was the crossing of the Muse. After careful analysis, we came to an agreed decision to use Aviation during the entire period of forcing the river, e.e., to make not one a convenient strike by bombers, both conventional and dive bombers, but from the very beginning of the crossing by constant attacks and disturbing raids to paralyze the enemy's artillery batteries in open firing positions, forcing the gun crews to constantly take cover from actual and false raids. On the map were mapped the tasks of the troops by time and boundaries. Shortly before the offensive began, at Göring's request, a battalion of the infantry regiment, Greater Germany, was loaded onto Storch-type transport planes for the purpose of landing on the morning of the first day of the offensive directly behind the Belgian front at Vitry, west of Martelange. The battalion's actions were intended to cause the enemy to be uncertain about the ability to defend their border fortifications. In order to quickly advance through Luxembourg and the southern part of Belgium, the three armoured divisions of the Corps entered the battle simultaneously in the first echelon, having close contact with each other on the inner flanks. The first armoured division was to advance in the centre, followed by Corps artillery, Corps headquarters, and most of the anti-aircraft artillery. In the initial period of the offensive, these forces struck the main blow. The 2nd Armoured Division was advancing on the right and the 10th Armoured Division with the Greater Germany Infantry Regiment on the left. The 1st Armoured Division was commanded by General Kirchner, the 2nd by General Feil, and the 10th by General Schaal. All three were well known to me. I believed in their abilities and in their goodwill. They knew my combat principles. They knew that tank formations going on the road have a travel ticket to the final stop. In our campaign, the final goal was the English Channel. This sounded clear and convincing to every soldier, even if he did not receive orders for a long time after the beginning of the offensive. Reaching the Channel On May 9, 1940, in the afternoon, at 13 h 30 minutes, sounded the battle alarm. At 4 p.m., I left Koblenz and arrived by evening at the Corps Command Post, at Sonnengoff near Bitburg, the troops were standing, as ordered, in readiness along the border between the Wanden and Echternach. On May 10th at 5.35 Minun, I crossed with the 1st Armoured Division, concentrated in the Wallendorf area, the Luxembourg border at Martelange. The vanguard of the 1st Armoured Division broke through the border fortifications, established communication with the Airborne Landing Regiment Great Germany, but advanced into Belgium only to a small depth, as it was prevented by severe destruction on the roads. The destroyed sections of roads in the mountainous terrain could not be bypassed. During the night, the roads were restored. The Twoned Armoured Division fought for Strenshan. The 10th Armoured Division advanced through Abela Neuve towards the French troops, 2nd Cavalry Division and 3rd Colonial Infantry Division. Corps headquarters moved to Rambruch, east of Martelange. On 11th of May in the afternoon, Mined areas along the Belgian border were overcome. By mid-afternoon, the 1st Armoured Division began its offensive. With tanks in the 1st Echelon, the division was advancing on fortified positions erected on both sides of the Neuchâteau and defended by Ardennes gamekeepers from the Belgian border troops and French cavalry. After short fighting with few losses, the enemy positions were broken through and Neuchâteau was taken. The 1st Armoured Division immediately organised a pursuit captured Bertry and already at dusk reached Bouillon, where the French, however, managed to hold out another night. Both other divisions advanced without delay, with little fighting, the 2nd Armoured Division taking Libramont. The 10th Armoured Division suffered minor losses at Ablaneuve. On May 10th, Lieutenant Colonel Ellerman, commander of the 69th Infantry Regiment, was killed at Saint-Marie. On the night of May 11th, 
the commander of the tank group Kleist ordered to immediately turn the 10th Panzer Division to Long Wai to ensure the left flank of the group, as there was a report that the French cavalry advancing from there. I asked to refrain from this, given that the diversion of one-third of my forces for the sake of ensuring the flank from a possible attack of enemy cavalry could disrupt the forcing of the Mayas River and thus the success of the entire operation. To avoid these difficulties caused by an incomprehensibly fear of the cavalry, I sent the 10th Panzer Division on a parallel road running north of the previously established for it the way of movement through rail to the section of the Reva Semois, Kionion Mortian with the task to continue the offensive. The threat of stopping the offensive and changing its direction was at first overcome. The command of the group abandoned its intention. The French cavalry never appeared. The great Germania Infantry Regiment was withdrawn from the battle in the evening and placed at the disposal of the Corps. Corps headquarters was stationed at Nashato during the night. On Trinity Day, May 12th at 5 o'clock, I left with the first echelon of my headquarters via Bertry, Fay le Venet, Belvaux for Bouillon, which, at 7 o'clock, 45 managers was attacked and quickly captured by Lieutenant Colonel Bulk's 1st Infantry Regiment. The bridge over the Semwa River had been blown up by the French, but the tanks were able to ford the river at various points. The engineers of the division immediately began to build a new bridge. Convinced of the expediency of the measures taken, I crossed the river and followed the tanks in the direction of Sedan, but had to return to Bouillon again as the roads were mined. In the southern part of the city, I had to endure the first enemy air raid on the bridge gunning area, of the 1st Armoured Division. The bridge fortunately remained undamaged, only a few houses caught fire. Then I drove through the forest to the 10th Armoured Division, which overcame the enemy defences in the area of Cunion and Herbermont. On the highway along which the division was advancing, I found myself witnessing the battle of a reconnaissance battalion for the border fortifications. Directly behind the scouts, came the infantry led by the brave brigade commander Colonel Fischer, followed by the infantry followed by the division commander General Charles. The rapid advance of the division, whose officers were in battle order, made a remarkable impression. The fortifications in the woods were captured in a short time. The advance continued through La Chapelle to Bazay and Balan. I was able to return in peace to Bouillon to the corps command post. Colonel Nehring, Chief of Staff, had in the meantime settled himself at the Panorama Hotel, which afforded a splendid view of the beautiful valley of the Semwa River. My place was tastefully carefully arranged in a niche with the hunter's trophies in the general workroom. We set to work. But suddenly several explosions were heard one after the other. Airplanes again. But this was not the end of the matter. A convoy with close combat equipment, explosives, mines and hand grenades caught fire. Explosions followed one after another. The giant head of a wild boar hanging above me flew off the wall and almost killed me. Other trophies also flew down. The glass in the window overlooking the beautiful valley where I was sitting, shattered and shards, flew right over my head. It became very uncomfortable to work here, and we decided to move to another place. A small hotel on a hill north of Bouillon, where the headquarters of the 1st Tank Regiment was located, was chosen. While inspecting the hotel, General von Stutterheim, commander of the short-range aviation connection, who was present there, drew my attention to the fact that the house was located in the open. Indeed, while we were talking to him, a squadron of Belgian airplanes appeared and dropped bombs on the location of the tanks. The losses were minimal, but we had to accept Stutterheim's warnings, and we decided to go even further north to the next settlements, Belvaux and Noirefontaine. But even before the beginning of this second move, a Storch airplane came to pick me up, which was to take me to the headquarters of General Kleist's group to receive the order. At headquarters I received orders to begin the offensive across the Maas River the next day, May 13th at 4pm. My 1st and 10th Panzer Divisions could be concentrated by this time at the initial positions, but the 2nd Panzer Division, which met with difficulties on the River Semois, of course, could not concentrate, I reported on this circumstance, which was of great importance, given the smallness of the entire advancing group. 
General von Kleist insisted on his order, and I had to admit that it would be more appropriate to start the offensive directly from the march without waiting for a full deployment. The subsequent order was even more unpleasant. General von Kleist and Air Force General Sperle, unaware of my agreement with Lurzer, decided to conduct a concentrated bombing raid before the artillery preparation. This could have derailed my entire plan of attack as a prolonged suppression of enemy artillery was no longer provided. I strongly protested and asked it to restore my original plan on which the entire offensive was based. But General von Kleist rejected my request and I flew on the same storch, but already with another pilot flew to his corps. My young pilot claimed that he knew the exact location of the landing place from which I had taken off, but at dusk he did not find it, and we very soon found ourselves over the Meuse and over the French positions. I experienced a rather unpleasant feeling being in an unarmed, defenceless storch, and then immediately oriented myself and ordered the pilot to fly north. We soon found the landing pad, and all turned out safely. Upon arrival at the Corps Command Post, I set about drafting orders and instructions with great zeal. We were given very limited time, and so, to speed up the work, we used the orders developed during the headquarters exercise in Koblenz, took them out of the files, changed the date and time, and then sent them to the troops. These orders corresponded exactly to the actual situation. The 1st and 10th Armoured Divisions did the same, which greatly accelerated and simplified the issuance of orders. On the evening of May 12th, the 1st and 10th Armoured Divisions seized the north bank of the river, Meuse, and took the historic city and fortress of Sedan. The night was used to get to the initial position and equip the firing positions of the Corps Artillery and Artillery of the Tank Group. The 1st Armoured Division, reinforced by the Great Germania Infantry Regiment, Corps Artillery and Heavy Artillery Divisions of both divisions operating on the flanks, struck the main blow. Consequently, the 2nd and 10th Armoured Divisions had only two light artillery divisions each on the first day of the offensive. This weakness of the flanks and artillery had to be taken into account in the fighting of both divisions on May 13. On May 13, the Corps Command post moved to La Chapelle. On the morning of May 13th, I went first to the command post of the 1st Armoured Division to check on the troops in the initial position. Then, after driving through partially mined terrain, which the drivers of the vehicles of my headquarters cleared of mines, and skipping through the artillery fire of the French fortifications, I arrived at the 2nd Armoured Division at Suny. The forward units of this division had reached the French border. In the middle of the day, I was already at the Corps headquarters, which by this time had moved to La Chapelle. At 3 p.m. 30 minuteur, despite the French artillery fire, I went to the advanced observation post of the 10th Armoured Division in order to observe the artillery preparations and aviation actions. On the way, I had to cross an area shelled by French artillery. At 4 p.m., the battle began with artillery preparation, quite significant for our conditions. With special tension I awaited the air attack. The planes appeared exactly at the appointed time, and my surprise was indescribable when I saw that squadrons of dive and conventional bombers, operating under cover of fighters, attacked the enemy exactly as we had agreed with Lurzer at the headquarters game. Either General von Kleist came to his senses, or the order to change the order of attack did not arrive at the destination. Either way, but the Air Force acted on those methods, which, in my opinion, were most favourable to our offensive, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I was now to follow the infantry advance across the Meuse. The fording of the river should have been completed by now, and I headed for saint Manges, and from there through Fluan to the planned crossing point of the 1st Armoured Division. In the first assault boat I could find, I crossed the river. On the other bank I met the smart and brave commander of the 1st Infantry Regiment, Lita Colin Valk, who was there with his staff. I was greeted with an exclamation, Boating on the Mars is forbidden. It was I who had once made such a remark at the preparatory staff training, when the reasoning of some young officers seemed to me too frivolous. Now they were able to correctly assess the situation. The advance of the 1st Infantry Regiment and the Great Germania Infantry Regiment on its left was proceeding like an inspector's review in a training camp. 
French artillery was almost completely overwhelmed by the constant exposure of dive bombers. Concrete structures on the banks of the Meuse were put out of action by the fire of anti-tank and anti-aircraft guns. Enemy machine guns were suppressed by our heavy weapons and artillery. The infantry was advancing on completely open ground, which was a wide meadow, but in spite of this the losses were very slight. Before darkness fell it was possible to cut deeply into a strip of enemy fortifications. The troops were ordered to continue the offensive all night, and I was confident that they would carry out this most important order. By 23 o'clock they captured Chevege and part of the forest of Marfe and broke through the leading edge of the French defences west of Vadelancourt. Overwhelmed with joy and pride, I headed for the corps command post in the Lagarain forest. I left just in time to be hit by another enemy air raid on the road to La Chapelle. Arriving at the command post, I sat down to look over the reports from the divisions on the flanks. The second armoured division, operating on the right flank, entered the battle only with its advanced units, reconnaissance and motorcycle battalions, supported by heavy artillery. The division could not ford the river with these forces. The 1st Panzer Division, together with the infantry brigade, was already on the left bank of the Mars, preparing to pull up artillery and tanks after the bridge. The great Germania Infantry Regiment was also on the other side of the Mars. The 10th Armoured Division, having crossed the river, established a small pre-bridge fortification. On this day it was in a difficult position due to lack of artillery support. The division's advance was severely hampered by flanking fire from the Maginot Line south of Douzy Carignan. The position of the 10th and 2nd Armoured Divisions improved. Corps' anti-aircraft artillery took overnight firing positions in the areas of flooding bridges over the Meuse, as on May 14th to count on the support of aircraft operating in another area, it was impossible. During the night I telephoned Lursa to find out how the aviation would be used in the future, and at the same time to thank him for the exceptionally good support which had contributed greatly to our successes. I learned that Spurl's order was late and could not be communicated to the squadrons, and that therefore Lerza had simply delayed it. I then reported by radio on the success of my troops Bush, who at one time in Berlin during a report to the Führer expressed doubts about whether I could force the mass. Bush gave me compliments. In conclusion, I thanked the officers of my staff for their dedicated work. On the morning of May 14th, the valiant 1st Armoured Division reported that it had greatly expanded its breakthrough during the night and passed through Shemery. So, forward to Shemery. On the banks of the Meuse are thousands of prisoners of war. At Shemery, I was present when the commander of the 1st Panzer Division gave the order. Having learned about the approach of large tank forces of the French, I ordered the 1st Armoured Division with all its tank units to start an offensive towards Ston. I myself went to the bridge across the Meuse, so that with the help of my task force located in this area, to organise the crossing of the 2nd Tank Brigade directly after the 1st and meet the French with large forces. The French were defeated. At Bulsen they lost 20 tanks, at Chemery, 50. The infantry regiment Greater Germany took possession of Bülsen and began to advance on villers mesoncel Unfortunately, shortly after my departure, our dive bombers attacked their infantry concentrations at Chemery, inflicting considerable casualties. Meanwhile, the 2nd Armoured Division had forced the Mars at Donchery and was preparing to attack the heights along the south bank of the river. I went there to familiarise myself with the progress of the battle. Having met the responsible commanders, Colonels von Wurst and von Prietwitz, in the combat orders of the units and talked with them, I returned to the Mars again. There the enemy planes began an intensive bombardment, but extremely bravely attacking French and British troops still failed to reach the bridge. Their losses were great. The anti-aircraft artillery was celebrating its day. It fired perfectly. By evening it had on its account about 150 downed aircraft. Subsequently, the regimental commander, Colonel von Hippel, was awarded the Order of the Knight's Cross. Meanwhile, the 2nd Tank Brigade continuous stream crossed the river, in the middle of the day. To our mutual joy, we were visited by the commander of the army group, Colonel General von Hundstedt, 
to familiarise himself with the situation. I met him with his report in the middle of the bridge just in time for a new air raid. He asked dryly, Is it always like this here? I could purely attest to that. He then thanked the brave troops very warmly. Forward again to the 1st Armoured Division. I met the division commander, accompanied by his chief of staff, Major Wenk, and asked whether the entire division could be turned westward or whether some of the forces should be left to cover the flank, deploying them with a front to the southeast of the Desarden Canal. Wenk said, thinking aloud, it's worth getting dirty. I have often used that expression myself. The matter was settled, the 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions immediately received orders to turn with all forces to the right, force the Desardens Canal, and advance westward with the task of completing the breakthrough of the French front. To coordinate the actions of both divisions, I went through Donchery to the headquarters of the 2nd Armoured Division, which was located in the castle of Rocan. From here I had a good view of the terrain over which the 2nd Armoured Division was advancing on May 13th and 14. I was surprised that the French long-range artillery from the Maginot Line so weakly and ineffectively shelled the concentration of our troops in the initial positions. Subsequently, when visiting the Maginot Line, the success of our offensive seemed to me just a miracle. In the afternoon I again returned to the command post to think about the organisation of interaction between the divisions on May 15th. Directly behind my corps followed the 41st Army Corps Rheingart, and beginning on May 12th he was introduced into the battle on the right flank of the 19th Army Corps in the direction of Mezières Charleville. On May 13th it had crossed the Meuse and was now advancing westward, General von Wittesheim's 14th Army Corps coming close to my corps and was soon to appear on the Meuse. The 1st Armoured Division had forced the Desarden Canal and, breaking stubborn enemy resistance, reached Sengli and Wandress. Tank units of the 10th Armoured Division passed the line of Mazonkel, Rocour et Flober and reached the heights south of Bulson, Telon with their main forces, capturing from the enemy more than 40 guns. The 19th Army Corps was tasked to reach the dominant heights in the Stoner area deprive the enemy of the opportunity to fire on the bridges across the Meuse and provide the advancing units in the second echelon unimpeded crossing. Infantry Regiment Greater Germany and the 10th Panzer Division began the attack on these heights on May 14th. The enemy offered stubborn resistance. The Ston locality repeatedly changed hands. On May 15th, the fighting ended. On May 15th, at 4 a.m., the commander of the 14th Army Corps, General von Wittesheim, came to my command post to arrange for a change of my corps at the pre-bridge fortification south of Sedan. After a brief discussion of the situation, we proceeded to the command post of the 10th Armoured Division, located near Bulsen. The division commander, General Schall, was in the forward units, chief of staff, an excellent commander, Lieutenant Colonel Baron von Liebenstein reported the situation and patiently answered many tricky questions of our successor. In order for the shift to take place under normal conditions, we decided that the 10th Armoured Division and the Infantry Regiment Great Germany until the full shift will be in the 14th Army Corps. I had to confine myself to giving orders to the 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions, the 10th Armoured Division, with its attached infantry regiment, Greater Germany, was tasked to provide the southern flank of the 19th Corps on the line, the Des Ardennes Canal, heights near Stone, the bend of the Maas River south of Villemontre. Already on May 15th, it was reinforced by advanced units of the 29th Motorised Division. From the command post of the 10th Armoured Division, I went to Stone to the infantry regiment, Great Germany. There the French launched an attack and some nervousness was felt in the mood, but the positions were eventually held. I then proceeded to the new corps command post in the woods near Sapon Fescher, already on the south bank of the Meuse. The night passed, contrary to my expectations. Very restless, but this was not due to the actions of the enemy, but to the difficulties created by our command. Commander of the tank group Kleist ordered to suspend the offensive and limited to the defence of the pre-bridge fortification. 
I did not want and could not agree with this order, for it meant the loss of the moment of surprise and a complete abandonment of the initial success already achieved. Therefore, I contacted first the chief of staff of the tank group, Colonel Zeitzler, and when I failed to resolve the issue with him, then directly with General von Kleist, I insisted that the order to halt the offensive be rescinded. After very lively and repeatedly interrupted negotiations, General von Kleist finally authorised the continuation of the offensive for another 24 hours in order to expand the pre-bridge fortification to accommodate the infantry corps. I touched on Gensch's mission in the conversation, and with this I was reminded of the miracle on the Marne of 1914. This thought probably caused an unpleasant feeling among the group commanders. Satisfied that I had won the right to manoeuvre freely, I headed out in the early morning of May 16th to the headquarters of the 1st Armoured Division. I drove through Vendressé to Aumont. The situation at the front was not yet quite clear. It was only known that during the night there was heavy fighting around Bouvelmont. So, to Bouvelmont, on the street of the burning village I met the regiment commander, Lieutenant Colonel Balk, who reported on the events of the night. The troops had had no real rest since May 9th and therefore felt very tired. Ammunition was running low. Soldiers in the front line slept in the trenches. Balk himself, wearing a sports waterproof jacket and with a knotted stick in his hand, told me that it was possible to capture the village at night only because he replied to his officer's proposal to stop the offensive. Then I alone will capture the village and moved forward. And moved forward. His men followed him. Bulk's dusty face and inflamed eyes spoke of the hard day and sleepless night he had endured. For this battle he had received a knight's cross. The enemy, a good Normandy infantry division and a Sparga brigade, fought very bravely. His machine guns kept the whole street of the village under fire. It is true that the enemy had not been firing artillery for some time. Bulk shared my opinion that the enemy resistance is paralysed. In the morning, we got into our hands a captured French order, if I am not mistaken, signed by General Gamelin himself. The order said, it is time to finally stop the flow of German tanks. This order further strengthened my conviction that it is necessary to continue the offensive by all means, because obviously the combat effectiveness of the French seriously worried their high command, now only to move without delay, without stopping. I ordered the men to line up and read them the trophy order, explaining its meaning and emphasising the importance of the immediate continuation of the offensive. Then I thanked the soldiers and officers for the combat successes and demanded to gather all the forces to finally consolidate the victory. After all this, I gave the order to disperse it to the tanks and continue the offensive. The veil that kept you in the dark soon fell. We came to the operational space and at a rapid pace began the pursuit. In Poitiers, I met the Chief of Staff of the 2nd Panzer Division, Lieutenant Colonel von Quast, informed him of the situation and went to Novion pour Sienne and from there to Montcornet. On the way, I overtook the marching column of the 1st Armoured Division. The soldiers cheered up, now they realised that this breakthrough, a complete victory. They greeted me with joyful shouts, well done, wonderful guy, our old man, saw the fast-moving hinds, etc. In the market square of Montcornet I met General Kempf, commander of the 6th Panzer Division of the Rheingard Corps, whose troops, having crossed the Meuse, came to the city at the same time as my units. We had to distribute the territory of the city between three armoured divisions, the 1st, 2nd and 1st, which in their irresistible onslaught to the west flooded its streets. We had no orders from the group as to the dividing line between the course, so we immediately on the spot united all divisions and began to continue the offensive to the last drop of gasoline. My advanced units reached Marl and Dursey. Meanwhile, I ordered the officers accompanying me to search the houses in the marketplace, and in a short time several hundred French prisoners from various units were collected. It was evident from their eyes how surprised they were at our sudden appearance. A tank company of the enemy, which had tried to break into the town from the southwest, was taken prisoner. 
It was part of General de Gaulle's division, which we knew was in the area north of Lyon. In the small village of Soise, east of Montcornet, a corps command post was deployed and communications were established with the 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions. We reported the progress of the day's fighting and our intentions to resume pursuit of the enemy on May 17th by radio to the tank group headquarters. See Diagram 3B. After the brilliant success of May 16th and the successful battles of the 41st Army Corps, I could not think that my superiors still think to fix on the bridge fortification at the Mass and wait for the arrival of the infantry corps. I was completely possessed by the idea that I expressed in March at a report to Hitler, namely, to complete the breakthrough and do not stop until the shore of the English Channel. I could not imagine that Hitler himself, who approved of Manstein's bold plan of attack and did not protest against my plan to make the breakthrough, could be afraid of his own courage and stop the offensive. However, I was monstrously mistaken. This became clear to me the next morning. On the morning of May 17th, I was informed from the headquarters of the tank group that the offensive must be stopped, and I must report at seven o'clock to the landing site for a personal conversation with General von Kleist. The latter appeared exactly at the appointed time and, without responding to my greeting, began to sharply reproach me for ignoring the plans of the High Command. He did not utter a word about the progress of my troops. When the first storm passed and there was a lull, I asked to be removed from command. General von Kleist was surprised, then nodded his head and ordered me to transfer command of the Corps to the senior commander after me. That was the end of our conversation. I went to the command post, called General File, and handed him the command of the Corps. I then reported by radio to the headquarters of Army Group Rundstedt that after the transfer of command I would arrive in the middle of the day to report. Very soon from there I received instructions to remain at my command post and await the arrival of Colonel General List, commander of the 12th Army, which was advancing behind my corps, who was charged with settling this conflict. Until the arrival of Colonel General List, orders were given to suspend the advance of all units. Major Wenk, who had returned to us, was fired upon en route by French tanks and wounded in the leg. General Ferl arrived at the command post and was brought up to speed. In the afternoon, Colonel General List arrived and asked what, in fact, we had going on. I explained it to him. He cancelled in the name of Colonel General von Rundstedt the order to remove me from my post and said that the order to stop the offensive was given by the general command of the land forces and therefore must be implemented. He agreed with my arguments regarding the continuation of the offensive and therefore authorised me on behalf of the Army Group Command to continue the advance of combat-ready reconnaissance units, but the Corps Command post should remain in the same place. This was already a step forward. I was very grateful to Colonel General List for his intervention and asked him to settle my conflict with General Kleist. And so I proceeded to advance combat-ready reconnaissance units. The Corps command post was still at its old location at Suez. I ordered a field cable to be laid between Corps headquarters and my forward command post, which obviated the need for radio communications that might have been intercepted by the radio intelligence of the Army High Command or the Armed Forces High Command. Even before receiving orders to halt the offensive, the 1st Armoured Division had occupied Ribemont on the Oise River and Cressy on the Serre River on the morning of May 17th. Advance units of the 10th Panzer Division, withdrawn from the area south of Sedan, reached Fryacourt and Soles Monclin already in the evening of May 17th, managed to create a pre-bridge fortification on the river Oise near Moya. May 18th at 9 o'clock, 2nd Panzer Division came to St. Canton. Acting to the left of the 1st Panzer Division also on this day forced the Oise and moved in the direction of Peron. The 10th Armoured Division was following the advance divisions on the left, also on Peron. On the morning of May 19th, the 1st Armoured Division succeeded in creating a pre-bridge fortification on the Somme River near the city. Several French headquarters that had arrived at Peron for reconnaissance were captured directly by us. The forward command post of the Corps moved to Vilsec, 
On May 19th, we passed the battlefields of World War I on the Somme. During the offensive north of the Enser and Somme rivers, securing the exposed left flank was initially entrusted to flank cover, consisting of scout, tank fighter and sapper units. There was little threat from the flank. As early as 16th May, we knew of the presence of a French armoured division, General de Gaulle's new formation, which, as already mentioned, had first engaged at Montcornet. De Gaulle confirmed our information a few days later. On May 18th, several tanks from his division came within two kilometres of my forward command post in the Olnona Forest, guarded only by a few 20mm anti-aircraft guns. I survived a couple of hours in lingering obscurity until these formidable guests turned back. There was also knowledge of a French reserve army of about eight infantry divisions forming up in the Paris area. We did not suppose that General Frey would move against us while we ourselves were still in motion. According to French principles of combat, he had to wait for accurate information about the location of the enemy. So it was a question of keeping him in the dark. This was best accomplished by a continuous offensive. On the evening of May 19th, the 19th Army Corps reached the line cambrai peron am According to my calculations, the 1st Armoured Division could be ready to advance on Amiens by 9 o'clock. I booked myself a car for 5 o'clock, as I wanted to witness this historic act. The officers on my staff thought that I wanted to leave too early and advised me to delay my departure, but I insisted and was right. When, on May 20th, at 8 o'clock, 45 Minado, I arrived on the northern outskirts of Amiens, the 1st Panzer Division was preparing to go on the offensive. On the way, I ascertained that the 10th Armoured Division was at Peron and learned interesting details about how the 1st Armoured Division's shift was proceeding. Parts of the 1st Armoured Division defending the bridge fortification were withdrawn without waiting for the arrival of the shift, because Lieutenant Colonel Bulk, who commanded them, did not want to miss the moment of the offensive on Amiens, which he considered more important than the defence of the bridge fortification. Colonel Landgraf, who had replaced him, was extremely indignant at such frivolity, but Balk replied to his reproaches, Well then, seize this bridgehead again, I had to capture it. Fortunately, the enemy gave Landgraf time to retake the abandoned bridgehead without a fight. I bypassed from the South Albert, still in enemy hands, and headed for Amiens, meeting countless columns of refugees on the way. The 1st Armoured Division's offensive was progressing well, and by mid-afternoon the town and a bridgehead about seven kilometres deep were in our hands. I took a quick look at the captured terrain and town, especially the beautiful cathedral, and quickly headed down the road to Alba, where I expected to find the 2nd Armoured Division. I rode toward the stream of advancing troops and refugees. Many enemy vehicles were wedged into the German marching columns, the drivers of which hoped to remain undetected in the thick dust, reach Paris and avoid capture. In a short time, I took 15 British prisoners. At Alba, I met Jenner Feuillet. The Second Armoured Division captured an English battery on the training ground, which was armed only with training shells, for no one had expected our appearance. Prisoners of war of various nationalities filled the square and streets of the city. The fears of the 2nd Armoured Division that the offensive would have to be suspended for lack of fuel soon dissipated. The division was ordered to reach Abbeville today. By 7pm, it fulfilled it, passing through dullen Berneville, Beaumé, saint riquier It is true that our planes put this division at a disadvantage by bombarding it from time to time. After I visited the commander of the 2nd Armoured Brigade, Colonel von Prittwitz, who was characterised by great mobility and made sure that he spoke at Abbeville, I went to Carrier, northeast of Amiens, where the Corps headquarters was moved. Here we were attacked by our own airplanes. It was such an unfriendly act that our anti-aircraft artillery returned fire and got one such inattentive bird. Both pilots parachuted out and were soon sitting in front of me, looking at each other with unpleasant surprise. When the first agonising part of the conversation was over, I propped the young men up with a glass of champagne. 
Unfortunately, they crashed a new reconnaissance armoured vehicle that had just arrived. Still, that same night, Spitz Battalion of the 2nd Panzer Division marched across the Neuel to the Atlantic coast. It was the first German unit to make its way to the ocean. On the evening of this momentous day, we did not know in what direction we would have to continue the offensive. Kleist's Panzer Group also did not receive orders to continue the operation. The day of May 21st was lost, waiting for orders. I used the day to visit the Somme crossings, the pre-bridge fortifications at Abbeville. On the way, I asked my soldiers how they regarded the operations carried out. Very good, replied an Austrian from the 2nd Armoured Division, but two days we wasted. Unfortunately, he was right. The possession of the coast of the English Channel May 21st came. The order to continue the offensive to the north with the task of seizing the Channel ports I wanted to send the 10th Armoured Division through Eden, St. Omer to Dunkirk, the 1st Armoured Division to Calais, and the 2nd Armoured Division to Boulogne, but had to change my plan because at B hour, May 22nd received an order from the command to allocate the 10th Panzer Division in the reserve of the tank group. Consequently, at my disposal for the offensive on May 22nd remained only the 1st and 2nd Panzer Divisions. Unfortunately, my request in order to quickly seize the channel ports to leave me all three divisions was not satisfied. With a heavy heart, I had to abandon the immediate offensive of the 10th Armoured Division at Dunkirk. The 1st Armoured Division, together with the infantry regiment arrived from Sedan, Great Germany, was now headed through Samay, Devray to Calais. The 2nd Armoured Division was advancing along the coast to Boulogne. On May 21st, an interesting event took place north of us. The British tanks made an attempt to break through towards Paris. Near Arras, they ran into the still unfired at that time SS Division Deadhead and caused panic in its ranks. They did not get through, but in some way influenced the mood of the headquarters of the tank group von Kleist, which suddenly began to show nervousness. On the soldiers, this influence did not spread. On May 21st, the 41st Army Corps, by forces of the 8th Panzer Division, reached Eden. The 6th Panzer Division occupied Buasel. In the morning of May 22nd began the offensive. At 8 o'clock was crossed the boundary of the River Oti in a northerly direction. Advance northward could not take place with all the forces of the 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions because both divisions, and especially the 2nd Armoured Division, had to leave garrisons to defend the Somme pre-bridge fortifications until they are not replaced by parts of the advancing behind us 14th Army Corps of General von Wittesheim, with whom we had already met at Sedan when he carried out a similar mission. On May 22nd, fierce fighting began near Devre, Samay, and south of Boulogne. Against us acted mainly the French, but there were also the British, Belgians and even some of the Dutch who had broken away from their units. The enemy was thrown back, but his aviation acted vigorously, bombing and shelling our troops, which could not be said about our aviation. Operational airfields were located far from the combat area. Aviation apparently could not quickly relocate to the forward airfields. Despite all this, we managed to break into Boulogne. The Corps command post was moved to Rex. Now the 10th Armoured Division was again part of the Corps. I decided to immediately turn to Dunkirk 1st Armoured Division, which had already come close to Calais, and the 10th Armoured Division, moving behind it from the area Dullen, to send through Sayed on Calais, with the capture of which could not be in a hurry. At midnight, I gave the Radio 1st Armoured Division the following combat order. Deploy in battle order north of the River Conch to 7 er 23.5. The 10th Armoured Division follows in the 2nd Echelon. The 2nd Armoured Division is fighting in Boulogne. Parts of this division on 23.5 follow through the Marquesas to Calais. The 1st Armoured Division to reach the line Audrucke, Ardres, Calais, then turn east and advance eastward through Bourbourg, Ville, Gravelines to Berg and Dunkirk. To the south, the 10th Armoured Division is advancing. Execution of the order on the password, advance east. After that, begin the performance at 10 Sewer.
Early in the morning on May 23rd, the order was transmitted with the password Advance East Tenzar. Advance south of Calais on Saint Pierre Broek and Graveline. On May 23rd, the 1st Armoured Division with battles began to move towards Gravelines. The 2nd Armoured Division was fighting at this time for Boulogne. The assault on the city was of a peculiar character, as the old city stone walls had long prevented our tanks and infantry from penetrating the city. With the help of ladders and the effective support of 18 Mi TT anti-aircraft guns, we finally managed to overcome the stone wall near the cathedral and penetrate the city. Fighting in the harbour began during which tank fire sunk one English torpedo boat and damaged several others. On May 24th, the 1st Armoured Division reached the Ar Canal between Olk and the coast and captured the pre-bridge fortifications at Olk, saint pierre Broek, Saint-Nicolas and Bourbourg. The 2nd Armoured Division fought to clear Boulogne. The 10th Armoured Division with its main forces reached the line of devres Samay. The cause was attached to the regiment life standard Adolf Hitler. I gave him the task to operate in the coastal strip to increase the rapidity of the offensive of the 1st Panzer Division at Dunkirk. The 2nd Panzer Division was ordered to withdraw from Boulogne all available units and direct them to the coastal strip. The 10th Panzer Division blocked Calais and began to prepare for the storming of the old sea fortress. In the afternoon I visited the division and ordered to advance systematically to reduce losses. For action on May 25th, the division was reinforced with heavy artillery that could be withdrawn from the Boulogne area. Rheingart's 41st Army Corps had established at St. Omer a pre-bridge fortification on the Ahr River, Hitler's fateful order to halt the offensive. On this day there was interference of the high command in the conduct of the operation, which had a detrimental effect on the entire course of the war. Hitler stopped the left wing of the German army on the river A.R. Crossing the river was forbidden. The reason was not given to us. The order of the high command said, Dunkirk to provide aviation. If the capture of Calais will encounter difficulties, then this city also to provide the air force. The contents of the order I pass on from memory. We were speechless. But it was difficult for us to contradict the order, not knowing the reasons that forced him to give it. So armoured divisions received the order, hold the coast of the English Channel, break in operations to use for repair of machines. Active activity of the enemy aviation did not meet with repulse from our side. On the morning of May 25th, I went to the coast to look for the headquarters of the Life Standard Regiment and to make sure that the order to stop the offensive was carried out. On arriving there, I saw the Life Lube Standard Regiment crossing the ARR. On the other side of the river, I could see a large hill 72 metres high, which dominated the whole surrounding marshy lowland. There, in the ruins of the old fortress, I found Sepp Dietrich, the regimental commander of the Leib Standarte Regiment. When I asked him why the order had not been carried out, he replied that the height was at everyone's throat, and therefore he, Sepp Dietrich, had decided to seize it on May 24th. The Leib Standarte Regiment and the Great Germania Infantry Regiment operating on his left were advancing toward warmer Burke. Despite this favourable development of the offensive, I confirmed on the spot the Führer's order, but ordered the 2nd Panzer Division to be pulled up to support the advance if necessary. On this day, Boulogne completely passed into our hands. The 10th Panzer Division had already begun fighting for the fortress of Calais. The British Commandant Brigadier Nicholson gave a laconic answer to the offer to surrender. The answer is no, as it is the British Army's duty to fight, as it is the Germans. On May 26, the 10th Armoured Division took possession of Calais. In the middle of the day, I arrived at the division's command post and asked its commander, General Charles, whether, as ordered, he intended to provide the fortress to the Air Force. He gave a negative answer because he thought that it was useless to bombard the thick stone walls and earthen coverings of the old fortress structures and there was no point for the sake of bombing to leave the positions already taken on the approaches to the fortress, which would have to be taken again. I could only agree with his opinion. At 16 hours, 45 minutes, the British capitulated. We captured 20,000 prisoners, 
of which three four thousand were British. The rest, the French, Belgians and Dutch, the bulk of them did not want to fight, because of which the British kept them locked in cellars. At Calais I met General von Kleist for the first time since May 17th, and received from him thanks for the successful action of my troops. This day we again tried to continue the offensive in the direction of Dunkirk and close the ring around this sea fortress. But here again orders came, demanding a halt. And just before Dunkirk we were stopped, we saw our air force in action. But we also saw the naval vessels of all types and classes, on which the British evacuated from Dunkirk. On this day, my command post was visited by General von Wietersheim in order to prepare the replacement of the 19th Army Corps by the 14th Army Corps. The advance division of this corps, the 20th Motorized Division, was subordinate to me and was put into action on the right of the Adolf Hitler Life Standard Regiment. Even before the negotiations regarding the shift, an interesting incident occurred. The commander of the regiment, Leibstandarte Zepp Dietrich, on the way to the front line came under machine gun fire from the British. Settled in a separate house in our rear, Zepp Dietrich's car caught fire, but he himself and the officers accompanying him managed to take cover in a ditch. Dietrich crawled with his adjutant into a pipe under the road crossing, and in order to protect himself from the burning gasoline flowing into the trench from the car, smeared his face and hands with wet clay. We accepted the requests for help transmitted by the radio station following the commander's vehicle and instructed the 3rd Regiment of the 2nd Armoured Division, which was advancing in this area, to relieve Dietrich. He soon appeared at my command post covered in clay. Unfortunately, he had to listen to ridicule. Only on May 26th in the middle of the day, Hitler authorised to continue the offensive on Dunkirk, but it was too late to expect a major success. On the night of May 26-27, the Corps again began the offensive. The 20th Motorised Division, which was attached to the Regiment Life Standard Adolf Hitler and Infantry Regiment Great Germany, reinforced with heavy artillery, was tasked to advance on Worma. The 1st Panzer Division was ordered, operating from the right flank to join the advancing troops to develop success. The Great Germania Infantry Regiment, effectively supported by the 4th Armoured Brigade of the 10th Armoured Division, reached its objective, the Kroshti Pitgam Heights. A tank reconnaissance battalion of the 1st Armoured Division occupied Brucke. Increased movement of enemy sea transports from Dunkirk through the strait was noticed. By May 28th we reached Worm and Bourbourg. On May 29th, the 1st Armoured Division took possession of Graveline. However, the capture of Dunkirk occurred without our participation. The 19th Army Corps was replaced on May 29th by the 14th Army Corps. This operation would have been carried out much faster if the High Command did not stop several times the troops of the 19th Army Corps and did not prevent its successful advance. It is very difficult to say what turn the war would have taken if then at Dunkirk managed to capture the expeditionary forces of England. At any rate, far-sighted diplomacy could have benefited greatly from such a military success. Unfortunately, this opportunity due to Hitler's nervousness was lost. Subsequently, motivating his decision to stop the offensive of my corps, he said that the territory of Flanders with its many canals allegedly unsuitable for the action of tanks. This explanation cannot be recognised as satisfactory. On May 26th, I expressed my sense of gratitude to my brave troops in the following Corps' order. Soldiers of the 19th Army Corps, 17 combat days in Belgium and France are behind us. A path of exactly 600 kilometres separates us from the German border. We have reached the coast of the English Channel and the Atlantic Ocean. You overcame the Belgian fortifications on this way, forced the Maas River, broke through the Maginot Line on the historic battlefield near Sedan, seized important heights in the area of Stony, then swiftly passed through saint Quentin and Peronne, and with battles came to the Lower Somme near Amiens and Abbeville. You crowned your military exploits with the capture of the Channel Coast with the sea fortresses of Boulogne and Calais. I demanded that you refuse to sleep for two days. You held out for 17 days. 
I ordered you to fight in spite of the threat on your flanks and rear. You never hesitated. With exemplary confidence in your strength and with faith in the realization of the tasks before you, you selflessly carried out every order. Germany is proud of its tank divisions, and I am happy to be your commander. We honor the memory of our fallen comrades. We are confident that the sacrifices made were not in vain. Now we will prepare for new feats. Long live Germany and our Führer Adolf Hitler. Signed, Guderian. Winston Churchill, in his Memoirs of World War II, Volmer Lito, PP 100 et Sec, of the German edition by I. P. Toth, suggested that Hitler, by stopping the advance of tank units on Dunkirk, wanted to give England an opportunity to make peace, or wanted to improve the prospects for Germany to make a favourable peace with England. Neither at that time nor later have I met with facts that could support this view. Another assumption by Churchill that the tank units were allegedly stopped by Rundstedt's decision is also untenable. As a participant in these battles, I can assure that although the heroic resistance of Calais deserves all recognition, but it had no influence on the course of hostilities at Dunkirk. On the contrary, it is correct to assume that Hitler and above all Goering believed that the superiority of the German air force is quite sufficient to prevent the evacuation of British troops by sea. Hitler was mistaken, and this delusion had dangerous consequences, for only the capture of the British Expeditionary Army could strengthen the British intention to make peace with Hitler or increase the chances of success of a possible landing operation in England. In Flanders, I received news of the wounding of my eldest son. Fortunately, this wound was not life-threatening. My second son had been awarded the Iron Crosses of the second and first class in France. He fought in a reconnaissance battalion of a tank division, but remained alive and even unharmed. On May 20th, General Kirchner received the Knight's Cross. He was followed on June 3 by General Fayel, Colonel Fisher, 10th Armoured Division, Lieutenant Colonel Balk, 1st Armoured Division, Oberleutnant Etzold, Motorcycle Battalion, Lieutenant Hanwau Air, 80th Infantry Regiment, and Field Fable Rubart, Engineer Battalion, 10th Armoured Division. Later, several other officers and soldiers received awards. Reaching the Swiss border on May 28th, Hitler ordered the creation of a tank group under my command. On June 1st, the Corps headquarters moved to Sinai-Liptai, southwest of Charleville, to prepare for the continuation of the campaign. Then, in the first days of June, in the area southwest of Charleville, was formed Guderian's Tank Group. The group's headquarters was made up of officers from the headquarters of the 19th Army Corps. Tested officer Colonel Nehring remained Chief of Staff, Major Byerline, Head of Operations, Lieutenant Colonel Rebel, head of the personnel department. The tank group consisted of the 39th Army Corps, General Schmidt, consisting of the 1st and 2nd Armoured Divisions and the 29th Motorized Division, the 40th Army Corps, General Rheingard, consisting of the 6th and 8th Armoured Divisions and the 20th Motorized Division, as well as several units directly subordinate to the command of the group. The tank group itself was subordinate to Colonel General List's 12th Army. The march to the new areas of concentration was successful. Especially well made the march of the 1st and 2nd Panzer Divisions, moving from the coast. The total length of the route was 250 kilometres, but because of the detours and detours that had to be made, as many bridges were destroyed, had to pass about 100 kilometres more, the strong fatigue of the men and worn-out materiel also had an impact. Fortunately, it was possible to give the troops a few days to rest and to repair the material. As a result of such a successful first period of the campaign in the West, all enemy forces in Holland, Belgium and northern France were paralysed. The front in the south was opened. In this environment, it was possible to destroy the main forces of tank and motorised forces of the enemy. In the upcoming second period of the campaign, the main task was to defeat the remnants of the French ground forces, a total of about 70 divisions, including two British divisions, and then conclude a favourable PRC. So, at least, we thought at the time, concentration and deployment of troops to continue the campaign was faster 
on the right flank, on the Somme River, than in the centre, on the rivers Ser and En. Therefore, the offensive army group von Bock could begin as early as June 5th, while the offensive army group von Rundstedt scheduled for June 9th. Acting as part of the army group von Rundstedt, the 12th Army was tasked to force the River Enne and the Ong Canal between Chateau Porcienne and Attigny, and then move in a southerly direction. The forcing of the river and the canal running parallel to the river at eight points was to be carried out by infantry corps. After the creation of pre-bridge fortifications and building bridges, tank divisions of my group were to go on the offensive through the fighting order of infantry, to go on the operational space and, depending on the situation, to move either to Paris or to Langres or to Verdun. I was assigned the task of reaching the Langres Plateau, where I was to receive orders for the subsequent offensive. I asked the commander of the 12th Army to allow me to advance divisions forward to the designated places of crossings and independently force the N. I was afraid that during the passage through the fighting order and the rear of the infantry corps with their large wagons on the roads will create traffic jams, which could hamper the management of divisions. But the commander wanted to keep the armoured divisions to complete the breakthrough, and therefore rejected my request. So the tank group took the initial position behind the infantry corps, with the expectation that the four armoured divisions to cross the river N on eight bridges as soon as they are completed their guidance. Both motorised divisions were to advance behind the tank divisions of their corps. The condition for the successful implementation of this plan was the successful forcing of the river by infantry corps and the creation of pre-bridge fortifications. On June 8th, the command post of the tank group was transferred to Beni. On June 9th, the first day of the 12th Army Offensive, I went to the observation post located slightly northeast of Rittel, to personally observe the advance of the infantry and not to miss the moment of the performance. After staying at the observation post from five to ten o'clock and not noticing anything, I sent my officers to the nearest bridge in the infantry lines, ordering them to find out whether they had succeeded in forcing the River N. By twelve o'clock I received a combat report from the Rittel front which stated that the offensive in the Rittel section had no success. My observers from other parts of the front reported that only at Chateau Porcienne managed to create a small pre-bridge fortification depth of one to two kilometres. I established contact with my friend, Chief of Army Staff General Mackenzen, and asked him to report to the commander that I propose in connection with the situation to pull up the tanks at night on this single pre-bridge fortification to the next morning to make a breakthrough in this area. Then, after visiting the headquarters of the 3rd Army Corps of General Haas, where I received brief information about the situation, I went to Chateau Porcienne. Returning from the pre-bridge fortification, I met north of the village of Chateau Porcienne, commander of the 39th Army Corps, General Schmidt and General Kirchner, and discussed with them the order of transfer of the 1st Armoured Division to the pre-bridge fortification. The division was to move out at dusk. Soon I met with the army commander, Colonel General List, who, having left the northern section of the front, was passing through the area where the 1st Panzer Division was located, and to his displeasure, noticed that some of the tankers were without uniforms, and some were bathing in a nearby river. He demanded an explanation from me as to why the troops had not yet advanced to the pre-bridge fortifications. On the basis of my personal impressions I had just received, I objected that the advance was impossible until the pre-bridge fortifications were established and sufficiently expanded, and that the lack of pre-bridge fortifications should not be blamed on the tank troops. Colonel General List immediately shook my hand, displaying his characteristic chivalrous manners, and calmly began to talk to me about continuing the offensive. After a short stay at the command post of the group, I again went to Chateau Porcienne to the pre-bridge fortification to follow the advance of my tanks and to coordinate matters of interaction with the commander of the infantry division. I met General Loch, 17th Infantry Division, there and coordinated the implementation of the plane. Until one o'clock in the morning I stayed at the front line, 
thank it, the wounded tankers and scouts waiting at the bridge for evacuation to the rear for their courageous behaviour in battle and went to my command post in Ben Yi to give orders for further action. During the second half of the day, it was possible to create two small pre-bridge fortifications west and east of Chateau Possien, which allowed the 2nd Armoured Division and the following units of the 1st Armoured Division to force the river. The offensive of my tanks was to begin on June 10th at BHH 30 Mindaus. At the appointed time, I went into battle order and forced forward the battalions of the 1st Infantry Brigade, which were too far in the rear. To my surprise, I was recognised by the infantry units in the front line. I soon found out that I was in the 55th Regiment, which at one time had been stationed in Würzburg. The officers and non-commissioned officers of this regiment knew me from the time when I was the commander of the 2nd Armoured Division, also stationed in this beautiful, unfortunately now completely destroyed city. They greeted me cordially. The advance of tanks and infantry began simultaneously and in a coordinated manner. The advancing troops passed through Avanson and Tanyon at a rapid pace and moved towards Neflis on the Retourne River. In the open terrain, tanks met almost no resistance. As the new French tactics of the main importance attached to the defence of settlements and woodlands, abandoning the defence of open terrain. In villages, our infantry, meeting stubborn enemy resistance, had to fight for individual houses and take barricades. At the same time, the tanks, which were bothered only by the ineffective fire of the French heavy artillery, located in the rear, behind the still-held front at Retel, broke through to the river Retourne and forced this swampy river at Neflisi. The 1st Panzer Division continued the offensive on both banks of the Retourne. South of the river, the 1st Armoured Brigade was advancing, north of it, Balk's infantry was operating. About mid-afternoon, as we approached Juniville, large enemy tank forces launched a counter-attack. South of Juniville, a tank battle ensued, ending in about two hours with our victory. In the afternoon, we took possession of Juniville. During the battle, Balk personally captured the French regimental banner. The enemy withdrew to La Neville. During the tank battle, I tried in vain to hit a French B tank with the fire of a French Trophy 47mm anti-tank gun. All the shells bounced off the thick armour walls without causing any damage to the tank. Our 37 mm and 20mm guns were also not effective against this machine. Therefore, we were forced to take casualties. At the end of the day, north of Juniville again fought hard with French tanks that had launched a counter-attack from Anel to Perth. These tanks were driven back. Meanwhile, the 2nd Armoured Division forced west of Chateau Porcien R. Aon Ond began to advance southward. By evening, it reached the line Oudilcourt, Saint Etienne. Rheingart's corps, which had not had time to ford the On River at the point assigned to it, crossed the river after the 1st Panzer Division. It was calculated that the capture of Juniville would soon force the enemy to cease resistance at Retel resulting in the Corps having freedom of action. The command post of the group was in the woods of Sévigny on the On River, southeast of Chateau Porcienne. For the night I headed there. Deadly tired, without even taking off my headdress, I threw myself on a pile of straw and immediately fell asleep. The caring rebel had ordered a tent to be pitched over me and posted a sentry near it to enable me to sleep for at least three hours. On the morning of June 11th, I arrived in the area of La Neville, where the 1st Panzer Division was advancing. Bulk showed me the banner he had captured. The offensive took place as on the training ground. Artillery preparation, the advance of tanks and infantry, the capture of the settlement, the breakthrough in the direction of Betoneville, a settlement well known to me from the First World War. On the river sweeper, the enemy increased resistance but his attack with a force of 50 tanks, probably from the composition of the 7th French Light Division, was inconclusive. We took the settlements of Norwaisben and saint hilaire le petit The 2nd Armoured Division reached Epoise. The 29th Motorised Division reached the woods southwest of this locality. Advancing on the left of the 39th Army Corps, 41st Army Corps, Rheingart had to before continuing to advance in a southerly direction. To repel the attack of the 3rd Mechanised and 3rd Armoured Divisions of the French, 
moving from the area of the Argonne Mountains on the left flank of the Corps. In the afternoon, returning to the command post of the group, I learned of the intention of the Commander-in-Chief of the Ground Forces to visit the tank group. I met Colonel General von Braukic already at the command post and reported to him the situation on my section of the front and my further intentions. I did not receive any new instructions. In the evening, the command post was transferred to Juniville. On June 12th, the offensive continued. The battle was fought by the 39th Army Corps, consisting of the 2nd Armoured Division, advancing on chalons sur marne 29th Motorized Division, and 1st Armoured Division, advancing on Vitry-le-Francois. The 41st Army Corps was to advance with its right flank across the Sompy to sweep. The movement of tanks was hampered by the unrelenting pressure of infantry, who crossed the River Enne after the tanks. The infantry in some areas caught up with the fighting tank units and because of insufficiently clear delineation of the offensive lanes intermingled with them. All requests to regulate the order of movement addressed to headquarters were in vain. At some crossings of the river, sweep unpleasant incidents between soldiers of different branches of the army were played out. Both infantry and tanks wanted to fight in the first echelon. Day and night marched brave infantry to meet the enemy. On the morning of that day, we crossed the Champagne Plateau, familiar to me since the fall of 1917. I headed for the 29th Motorized Division of General Baron von Langemann, which had just arrived at the front and which I found on the northern edge of the Mourmelon le Grand camp. The division commander, who was in the position of a reconnaissance battalion, was just giving orders for an attack on the camp occupied by the enemy. The order was short and clear. All this together made a very good impression. Satisfied with everything I had seen, I could go on to chalon sur marne to the 2nd Armoured Division. By the time I arrived, our units had already reached chalon sur marne Forward reconnaissance patrols passed the bridge over the Marne, but unfortunately did not immediately check the explosion chambers, despite clear instructions that in this regard should be acted with great care. And just as our soldiers were about to cross the bridge, it went up in the air. Unjustifiable loss of life. While I was still in conversation with General Fail regarding the continuation of the offensive, I was summoned to the command post of the group to meet the commander of the army group, Colonel General von Rundstedt. By evening, the 1st Armoured Division had reached bussy le chateau It moved on to Etrepy on the Rhine-Marne Canal. Rheingard's corps on this day was engaged in defensive fighting with the enemy advancing from the Argon Mountains in a westerly direction. I met the divisions of the corps in the afternoon in the neighbourhood of Maschaut and was convinced of the expediency of their action. Suen, Tayur and Manre passed into our hands. On my way back to the group command post, again encountering infantry units that had crossed the path of our advance, again I asked in vain to the headquarters of the 12th Army to regulate the movement. Now the tank group began to receive several contradictory orders every day, demanding that we turn to the east or continue advancing south. First we were to capture Verdun, then to advance in a southerly direction, then turn to St. Michel, then again to advance in a southerly direction. All these changes experienced only Rheingart's corps. As Schmidt's corps, I was always advancing to the south, and thus ensure the constant advance in one direction, at least half of the tank group. On June 13th, I visited Rheingart's corps, 6th and 8th Panzer Divisions, which was still fighting the enemy advancing from the Verdun and Argonne Mountains areas. By evening I arrived at the 1st Armoured Division, which had reached the Rhine-Marne Canal at Etrepy. The commander of the 39th Army Corps ordered not to force the canal. I knew nothing about this order. It was also not to my taste. At Etrepy I asked Bolk, the indefatigable commander of the forward regiment of the 1st Armoured Division, whether he had already taken possession of the bridge over the canal. He answered in the affirmative, had he established a pre-bridge fortification? After a slight hesitation, he also answered, yes. I was surprised at the restraint. Could a car drive onto the pre-bridge fortification? An incredulous look, a hesitant, yes. So, let's go. On the pre-bridge fortification were diligent engineering officer Lieutenant Bieber, 
who, risking his life, prevented the destruction of the bridge, and the infantry battalion commander, Captain Eckinger, who took possession of the bridge and created a pre-bridge fortification. I was delighted that I was presented with the opportunity to present both brave officers with the Iron Cross First Class here. I then asked Balk why he was not advancing further. It was only at this point that I learned of an order from the commander of the 39th Army Corps demanding that the advance be halted. Balk's surprising restraint was explained by the fact that he had violated the order at his own risk and wanted to avoid blame. Again we stood, as at Bouvelmont, on the eve of the completion of the breakthrough. Again it was impossible to tolerate delays, stops. Balk expressed his impression of the enemy. In front of him were coloured troops defending the canal, supported by a small amount of artillery. I gave the order to immediately attack on St. Dizia and promised myself to settle the matter with the division commander and the corps commander. So Balk sprang into action. I went to the division headquarters and ordered the entire division to begin the advance. Then I familiarly said General Schmidt with my order to the First Armoured Division. Finally, already at dusk, passing through the location of the 29th Motorize Division, approaching the canal at Brusson, I came across, north of Vitry-le-Francois, the 5th Reconnaissance Battalion of the 2nd Armoured Division. Here I was briefed on the progress of the division's offensive. June 14th, at nine o'clock, German troops entered Paris. In the offensive strip of Guderian's tank group, the 1st Panzer Division reached Saint-Dizier still at night. The French prisoners of war belonged to the 3rd Panzer Division, the 3rd North African Division, and the 6th Colonial Infantry Division. The soldiers gave the impression of exhausted men. West of the 1st Armoured Division, the Rhine-Marne Canal and the rest of the 39th Army Corps were forcing the Rhine-Marne Canal. Rhine Guards Corps reached the canal at Revigny east of Etrepy. In the middle of the day, after a meeting with the commander of the 1st Armoured Division, I arrived in Saint-Dizier and in the square saw my friend Bulk sitting in a chair. He was the first person I met here. He was counting on a quiet night after all the disturbances of the last 24 hours. But I was to disappoint him greatly. The sooner we could resume our offensive, the greater our success would be. So Balk received orders to immediately begin the advance on Langres. The entire 1st Armoured Division began to carry out this order. The offensive continued through the night, and by the morning of June 15th, the old fortress capitulated. 3,000 prisoners of war. The 29th Motorised Division was directed through Vassy to Jusenancourt, the 2nd Armoured Division through Montières en deux, Soulan deuil to bar sur aube Rheingart's Corps was given the task of advancing in a southerly direction. The plan of the main command of the land forces to turn the tank group through Juniville, Neuchâteau on Nancy, has already been expressed in the relevant orders, but the troops received timely counter-orders. On the morning of June 16th, I went to Langres, arrived there about mid-afternoon and ordered the 1st Armoured Division to advance on Grey Besançon, the 29th Motorised Division in the direction of the River Sona, southwest of Grey, the 2nd Armoured Division, on Tilchatel. Eastern Amman, 41st Army Corps, continued to advance in a southerly direction. On my right, on Dijon, was advancing 16th Army Corps of Kleist's group. The 1st Panzer Division began its offensive at 1300 hours. At this time, I, together with my small task force, was sitting in the officers' mess hall, which had a beautiful view to the east from the garden. I was, however, concerned about my exposed and overstretched flank, as word began to reach me that French troops were moving in from the east. During the latter part of the afternoon, General Victorin's 20th Motor Division reached Langres, and, advancing toward Vesoul, took over the supply of the left flank. West of Langres, the 29th Motorized Division was advancing. The situation was becoming clearer by the hour. Until the evening were captured, bar sur aube Grey, bar le duc In the fighting for the town of Grey, its commandant, General de Courzon, was killed. In the evening, the command post of the group was transferred to Langres, 
I did not receive an order from the General Command of the Land Forces on the further tasks of the tank group and sent a liaison officer of the General Command, who was attached to my headquarters, by airplane to the headquarters of the General Command to report my intention to continue the offensive towards the Swiss border. We stayed in Langres in the homes of friendly people and after extremely strenuous recent days enjoyed every comfort. On June 16th, the 1st Armoured Division succeeded in capturing an undestroyed bridge at Kitter, north of Grey, and crossed the Somme. Our airplanes bombed this bridge for several hours in succession, delaying the crossing of the river. These were, in all probability, the planes of Lieb's Army Group, but we were unable to establish communication with them and explain their mistake. Fortunately, there were no losses. The 39th Army Corps reached in the middle of the day the line Bessonson à Vannes, the 41st Army Corps, sending its armoured divisions behind the 20th Motor Division, seized the towns of port sur soya Vesoul and Bourbon-les-Bains. Thousands of prisoners were taken, among them Poles for the first time in this campaign. In Bessonson, 30 tanks were captured. On June 17th, Colonel Nehring, my indefatigable chief of staff, gathered on a small terrace between the headquarters room and the wall of the old fortress, all the officers of the headquarters to warmly congratulate me on my birthday. He was happy that he could relate his congratulations to the report of the withdrawal of the 29th Motorized Division to the Swiss border. This success was a very great joy for all of us. I immediately went to this division to congratulate the brave troops on this momentous occasion. About twelve o'clock I arrived at Pontarclieu to General Baron von Langemann, having overtaken on my long journey the main forces of the division, which continued to advance. Everywhere the soldiers congratulated me joyfully. On my report about the exit to the Swiss border at Pontarclieu, Hitler responded with a request. Your report is based on a mistake. It means, in all probability, Pontarclieu on the River Sona. Only my reply, there is no mistake, I myself am at Pontarclieu on the Swiss border, reassured the incredulous High Command of the Armed Forces. A visit to the frontier followed, where I talked with some brave chiefs of reconnaissance groups, to whose tireless activity we owed valuable information about the enemy. Among them was the extremely energetic Lieutenant von Bunau, who unfortunately later had to give his life for Germany. From pont a I sent a radiogram to the 39th Army Corps, ordering an immediate turn to the northeast. The purpose of this advance was to establish communication with General Dolman's 7th Army, which was advancing from the Upper Alsace area, and to cut the communications linking the French troops concentrated in Alsace-Lorraine with France. This difficult 90-degree turn was made with the precision characteristic of all manoeuvres of my armoured divisions. Although, according to orders, the division's routes of movement overlapped, nevertheless the march was accomplished without difficulty. I felt a sense of satisfaction when in the evening I found in my headquarters order of Army Group Lieb, according to which my tank group was reassigned to this group and headed for Belfort, Epinal. We could report that the said manoeuvre was already in progress. Six years later, while in Nuremberg prison, I found myself in the same cell with Field Marshal Ritter von Lieb. One day, in that gloomy place, we had a conversation about 1940. Field Marshal Ritter von Lieb could not understand how I was so suddenly quick to carry out his order to attack Belfort Epinal, and I had to give him an explanation. The coincidence of the operational views of the commanders of the tank group and the army group led to the adoption of the same decision. Dining at headquarters, located in the picturesque village of Avanay near Bessonson, above the valley of the River Oak, I had the good fortune to see my second son, Kurt, who a few days before had been transferred from the reconnaissance battalion of the 3rd Panzer Division in the convoy battalion of headquarters. Taking advantage of his business trip, he stopped by to see me that day. Around midnight I received a call from Major Wenk, Chief of Operations of the 1st Armoured Division, reporting that the division had reached Montbéliard, thus reaching the objective indicated to it by the 39th Army Corps. 
Wenk continued that the division still had sufficient fuel to continue the offensive. Since he could not contact the Corps commander, he decided to appeal directly to me to ask permission to continue the offensive at Belfort. It goes without saying that he received the desired permission, for I had in no way intended to make a halt at Montbéliard. Probably some accidental circumstance forced the 39th Army Corps to stop the divisions not at Belfort, which was specified in my order as the final object of the offensive, but at another intermediate point. At the decisive moment, the Corps headquarters was changing its location, and so the division could not contact it. It was a story of a traffic ticket to the terminus. The moment of surprise was fully utilised. After a short rest, I headed for Belfort on the morning of June 18th. Between Montbéliard and Belfort, along the highway, stretched French motor convoys that had already capitulated to our troops. Among them were many heavy artillery. At the entrance to the old fortress were thousands of prisoners. However, there were no German military flags on the forts, and shots were still coming from the city. In Belfort, in a deserted and quiet square, I stopped a liaison motorcyclist from the 1st Armoured Division and asked him to escort me to the division headquarters. The nimble young man escorted me to the Hotel Paris, where the division commander was. There I was met by Wenk. My appearance at such an early hour greatly surprised him. He reported my arrival to the commander who was taking a bath. I well understood the desire of the officers of the headquarters to clean up after the fever of the last few days, and used the time before Kirchner's arrival to sample the breakfast prepared for the captured French officers. I then ordered a report of the situation. The division had taken possession of only a part of the town, and the forts were still in French hands. Negotiations were begun, but only the troops occupying the barracks agreed to surrender. The garrisons of the forts refused to surrender without a fight and were attacked by our troops. The division created a battle group to take possession of the forts and the fortress, and in the middle of the day began their assault. The first to fall was Fort Bas Perche, then under me surrendered Fort Ot Perche and the fortress. The method of taking possession of the fort and forts was quite simple. A short fire raid by the artillery of the 1st Armoured Division, then an advance to the fort by Eckinger's infantry battalion on armoured personnel carriers, accompanied by 88 Nilimitos anti-aircraft guns, which stopped against the fort's throat. The infantrymen approached the glasses without casualties, dismounted from the vehicles, crossed the ditches and climbed the rampart. The anti-aircraft gun was fearing at the Gorgia at this time. We then demanded from the enemy the surrender of the fort. The swiftness of the assault forced the enemy to capitulate. As a sign of complete surrender, our military flag was hoisted over the fort, and the assault group proceeded to capture the next fortification. Our losses were quite insignificant. Other units of the 1st Armoured Division under Colonel Netvig reached this day Giromagni, north of Belfort. They took 10,000 French soldiers and officers prisoner, captured 40 mortars, 7 airplanes and a large amount of war materials. On the same day, the headquarters of the tank group was moved to Montbéliard. Meanwhile, the French government had resigned and the old Marshal Pétain formed a new cabinet which proposed an armistice on June 16th. Henceforth, our main task was to establish communication with General Dolman and to close the ring around the enemy's forces in Alsace-Lorraine. While the 29th Motorised Division was advancing with fighting through the Jura Mountains toward Le Mont and toward Mount Prunterutha, the 2nd Armoured Division reached the Upper Moselle at Rupt and Remiremont. General Kempf's 6th Armoured Division took possession of Epinal. The fighting for Epinal was much like the 1st Armoured Division's fighting for Belfort. In each of these fortresses were captured 40,000 prisoners. The advance units of the 7th Army operating in Upper Alsace reached Nieder-Asbach, south of Senheim. On June 19th, the advance continued, with the 7th Army in contact at Le Chapelle, northeast of Belfort. Some resistance was offered only by the eastern forts of Belfort, but soon they also capitulated. Parts of the 1st Armoured Division stormed El César Bellepin and Ballon de Servant, and at midnight took possession of Tilo. 
the second armored division captured the fort of rouet sur moselle in the Vosges began the offensive with a broad front. The infantry divisions of the 1st Army Corps advancing from the north to Epinal had to be suspended, as their further advance would cause congestion on roads already clogged with tank units. The infantry, who also wanted to take part in this campaign, sharply expressed their dissatisfaction to the group command. I immediately sent by airplane my chief of operations, Major Byerline to Colonel General Ritter von Leib to explain to the latter the reasons that prompted me to stop the advance of the infantry divisions. Major arrived at the General just in time to prevent an explosion of anger of the commander. The headquarters of the tank group was moved to the old resort place in the Vosges, Plombières, known even to the ancient Romans. Here we had a good three days. The resistance of the French was completely broken. June 20th, fell Cornimont, 21, Boussan in the Vosges. The second armoured division reached saint amé and Le Tolly. The 29th motorised division reached Del and Belfort. We took about 150,000 soldiers and officers as prisoners of war. When counting the prisoners of war between the generals of army group Caesar, a dispute arose, which was terminated by the straw decision of Colonel General Ritter von Lieb, who recognised my figure of prisoners of war, 15,000, correct, and in addition made a flattering comment to me that without the encompassing manoeuvre of the tank group through Belfort Epinal, the total number of prisoners of war would have been much lower. The total number of prisoners of war of the tank group after the forcing of the River N was 250,000. To this should be added a large amount of equipment. On June 22nd, the French government concluded an armistice. The terms of the armistice were not at first communicated to us. On June 23rd, after passing through the gorge and over the Kaisersberg mountain in the Vosges, I sought out General Dolman at his headquarters, at Colmar, Alsace. I saw again the places where I had spent my childhood. My headquarters was soon transferred to Besançon and housed first in a hotel, then in the French Corps headquarters building. I took advantage of the end of hostilities to thank my commanders and staff officers for their hard work and combat exploits. Our cooperation had been perfect. The brave troops had carried out the arduous tasks assigned to them with the greatest devotion. Truly, they could be proud of their successes. On June 30th, I bade them farewell with the following order. Guderian's Group Besançon, June 30th, 1940. Orders for the tank group. At a time when the Guderian Group is changing its organisational composition, I wish to bid a heartfelt farewell to all headquarters and troops who are leaving the group and going to other tasks. The victorious march from the N River to the Swiss border and the Vosges will go down in history and remain in it as a heroic example of a breakthrough made by mobile troops. I thank you for this feat, which was the perfect culmination of my struggles and aspirations for a whole decade. With the same enthusiasm and with the same success, continue to fulfil new tasks until the final victory of the great Germany. Heil Führer, signed Guderian Armistice. I recall two visitors who visited me in Besançon. On the evening of June 27th, General Ritter von Epp, commander of the 19th Infantry Regiment, who was passing through Besançon looking for his regiment, arrived. I knew this general from a joint hunting trip in Spechtewald. We had a long and extensive conversation about the armistice with France and the continuance of the war against England. This conversation gave me particular pleasure, as the isolated position in which I was placed prevented me from forming an opinion. The second visitor, with whom I discussed the same subject on July 5th, was the Reich Minister of Armament and Military Industry, Dr. Tort who had come to see me in order to use the recent experience of combat operations in the interests of the further development of tank construction. I did not like the armistice just concluded to the jubilation of the German people and to Hitler's satisfaction. After the complete victory of German arms won over France, we could have concluded another peace treaty. We could have demanded the complete disarmament of France, the complete occupation of the country, the abandonment of the war fleet and the colonies but it was also possible to go the other way, the way of understanding, to propose to the French to preserve the integrity of their country, their colonies, 
and their national independence for the sake of a quick peace also with England. Between these two extremes there could have been various options. Whatever decision was taken, but if taken, it was to create favourable prerequisites for the German Reich to quickly end the war, not only against France, but against Britain. To end the war with Britain, it was necessary first of all to seek diplomatic negotiations more confidently. Hitler's proposal from the rostrum of the Reichstag could not be considered a diplomatic step. It is now clear to me that it is unlikely that England would have entered into negotiations with Hitler at that time. Nevertheless, an attempt should have been made to start negotiations, if only to avoid reproaching ourselves later for refusing to use peaceful means to resolve the conflict. But if diplomatic steps did not produce the desired results, military means should have been used immediately and with all their force. Of course, Hitler and his staff thought about continuing the war against Great Britain. This is evidenced by the operation known as Sea Lion, which involved the landing on the British Isles. Given our lack of preparation for warfare at sea and in the air, which prevented us from landing on the British Isles, it was necessary, in addition, to find other solutions that would allow us to deal a sensitive blow to the maritime power and force it to negotiate. At that time, the most effective way to quickly establish peace I saw in the most immediate continuation of our offensive towards the mouth of the Rhone, so that after mastering the French ports in the Mediterranean Sea in cooperation with the Italians to land airborne landing in Africa and on the island of Malta. If the French join us, so much the better. If not, we and the Italians must alone continue the war and without delay. It is known how weak the British were then in Egypt. Large Italian forces were still in Abyssinia. The air defence of Malta was weak. It seemed to me that everything spoke in favour of continuing our operations in this direction. All in favour, nothing against. It was necessary to quickly transfer four to six armoured divisions in Africa and create there an overwhelming superiority in force before the British had time to move reinforcements. The results of a German-Italian landing in North Africa in 1940 would have been much more favourable for us than in 1941, after the first defeat of the Italians. It is quite possible that the distrust Hitler felt toward the Italians kept him from moving the war to Africa. But it is even more likely that Hitler, being a prisoner of purely continental views, did not realise the decisive importance of the Mediterranean area for the British. In any case, I heard nothing more about my proposals, and only in 1950 learned that General Ritter von Epp still found it possible to communicate them to Hitler. According to the report of Captain First Rank Wenig, who accompanied Epp, Hitler refused to speak on the substance of these proposals. Staying in Besançon gave me an opportunity to familiarise myself with the Jura Mountains, and on July 1st from Mont Ronde to see the Lake Geneva, which I knew well. I then visited Lyons to see my eldest son there, who had been wounded a second time during the Western Campaign and had received an extraordinary rank for bravery. Correct relations were established with the Prefect and with the Burgomaster of Besançon. Both were characterised by extreme politeness. In early July the tank group was disbanded, some divisions were sent to Germany, others in the Paris area. The headquarters of the tank group also arrived in the Paris area. We were supposed to prepare for a big parade in honour of the Führer, but fortunately it did not take place. While in Paris I visited Versailles and Fontainebleau, a magnificent old castle with beautiful historical monuments. With special interest I inspected the Napoleon Museum at Malmaison. The old, dignified director did me the courtesy of accompanying me on a tour of the museum. The explanations given by this great expert in the history of the great Corsican were very instructive and interesting to me. It goes without saying that I took in all the sights of Paris as far as was possible under the conditions of the war. At first I lived at the Hotel Lancaster, then I moved to a private apartment in the Bois de Boulogne. My stay in Paris was interrupted by a meeting of the Reichstag on July 19, to which I was ordered to arrive with many other generals. At the meeting, Hitler's order was read to award me the rank of Colonel General. Since the parade was cancelled, there was no reason for a prolonged stay of the headquarters of the tank group in Paris. Therefore, in early August, we were transferred to Berlin, where we were given the opportunity to rest. 
Meanwhile, the units that remained in France were preparing for the implementation of the plan Sea Lion, which, however, already from the beginning were not taken seriously enough. This plan, in my opinion, was completely unpromising due to the lack of sufficient aircraft, the necessary naval tonnage, and the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Corps from Dunkirk. The two reasons given first are the best proof that Germany had no intention of waging war with the Western powers and was not secretly preparing for it. When the fall storms began in September, the Sea Lion plan was finally buried. The preparation of tank forces for Operation Sea Lion made it possible to test underwater tanks of the TUII and TIV types. By August 10, these vehicles were already in combat readiness at the tank site in Putlos, Holsteinia. In 1941, they were used in Russia during the crossing of the Western Bug River. Based on the experience of the Western campaign, Hitler demanded to bring the output of tanks to 800, 1,000 vehicles per month. Calculations of the armament department of the land forces showed that for this purpose it would be necessary to spend 2 billion marks and use up to 100,000 unskilled workers and specialists. Due to such enormous costs, Hitler unfortunately had to abandon his intention. Hitler further demanded that the T-3 tank be armed with the 50mm L60 gun instead of the previous 37mm gun. However, the tank was fitted with the 50mm gun, L42, with a shorter barrel. In all likelihood, Hitler did not immediately recognise why the armament department had decided to change the type of gun. When he noticed in February 1941 that his instructions had not been carried out, although the technical possibilities allowed it, he was very angry and could never forgive this arbitrariness to the heads of the department. Some years later he recalled it. After the campaign, Hitler had at his disposal a much larger number of tank and motorised divisions. The number of tank divisions in a short time doubled, but the number of tank units included in the division was also halved. Thanks to these measures, the German ground forces nominally had twice as many tank divisions, but their striking power, which should have been taken care of in the first place, did not increase. At the same time, the doubling of the number of motorised divisions caused such a severe strain on our automobile industry that Hitler's demands could be met only at the cost of using all available stocks of motor vehicles, including war trophies. The trophy materiel was slightly inferior to German materiel. In particular, it did not meet the increased demands placed on motor vehicles in the Eastern and African theatres of war. I was assigned to oversee the formation and combat training of several tank and motorised divisions. I had more than enough work to do. In my rare leisure hours I puzzled over the problem of the further continuation of the war, which, one way or another, but must end some day. My thoughts went southward. I maintained the view I had expressed at Besançon that the end of the war against Great Britain was the most important and even the only important issue. I had no contact with the general command of the land forces and with the general staff, so I did not participate in the discussion of the reorganisation of armoured forces and the problem of the further conduct of the war.